Ed and Lorraine Warren were two of the most iconic and influential paranormal investigators in history. Going all the way back to 1952, they had been trailblazers in the ghost hunting industry, investigating over 10,000 unique cases up until each of their deaths in 2006 and 2019. Ed and Lorraine were highly respected professionals, even amongst non-believers, and were essentially A-list celebrities to those in the paranormal and demonology circles. Their lectures, research, books and media have influenced pop culture unlike anyone else in the medium, and are still talked about on a daily basis around the world. In other words, they may never be two more knowledgeable paranormal experts to walk this earth than Ed and Lorraine Warren. But for all their infamous exploits, speaking to spirits and detecting demons, and researching wraiths, there have been a select few that have terrified even the stone-cold Warrens to their core. Cases of the supernatural so evil and horrific, they vow to end their investigations and leave the entities alone. Even they knew that not all ghosts are meant to be tamed. In honour of their unparalleled paranormal work that spanned their career, we're diving deeper into five of these cases that made Ed and Lorraine Warren's blood run cold. Hit those lights, sit back, and enjoy. Amateurville House In the dark annals of true crime history, few stories are as chilling as the Amateurville horror. In 1974, a seemingly ordinary Long Island family was brutally murdered in their suburban home. The heinous act shocked the nation and inspired a string of books and movies that continue to haunt our collective consciousness. On November 13, 1974, Ronald Defoe Jr., a 23-year-old man, committed an unthinkable act. In the dead of night, he used a 35 caliber rifle to execute his parents, Ronald Defoe Sr. and Louise Defoe, along with four of his siblings, Dawn, Allison, Mark and John. The victims were found in their nightclothes, shot in the back while they slept. There were no signs of a struggle, only a chilling silence in their upscale home in Amateurville, New York. The news of this gruesome family massacre shocked the tight-knit community and the nation at large. The family had appeared to be an average good family, making the crime all the more incomprehensible. A sign outside their home read, High Hopes, hinting at dreams and aspirations that had been shattered in the most horrific way. Ronald J. Defoe Jr. reported the killing to the police. He initially claimed to have discovered the crime scene upon returning home, but he would later confess to committing the murders himself. He described in gruesome detail how he shot each family member one by one, claiming he had heard voices compelling him to do so. In a bizarre turn of events, the Defoe family's former home was purchased by George and Kathy Lutz a year after the murders. However, they claimed to have experienced supernatural phenomena, including slamming windows, welts appearing on Kathy's body at random, oozing slime from the walls, and ghoulish apparitions, such as the red eyes of a demon peeking around corners of the house. Their story inspired Jay Anson's 1977 book, The Amateurville Horror, which in turn led to a series of movies. While the Lutzes insisted their experiences were real, many have since regarded the Amateurville haunting as a hoax. Ed and Lorraine Warren were not amongst the detractors though. In fact, they believed in the Amateurville paranormal activity so much so, they vowed to never go back. In 2013, Lorraine gave the following quote when asked about her personal experience with the house. Her reasoning is justified too, when looking back through the case files covering the Warrens' investigation at Amateurville in March of 1976. During their analysis of the home, they captured an infrared time-lapsed photograph depicting a demonic boy whose eyes glowed at the bottom of the stairs. The image was taken by professional photographer Jean Campbell and serves as the key reference for why the Warrens never returned to such a demented, dastardly local. Annabelle. The story of Annabelle, the allegedly possessed doll, has captured the imagination of many, 
thanks to the claims made by paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren. The Warrens recounted the tale of Annabelle, tracing it back to 1971, when a student nurse received a Raggedy Ann doll as a gift. According to their narrative, the doll exhibited bizarre and unsettling behaviour, leading the students to consult a psychic medium. The psychic claimed that the doll harboured the spirit of a deceased girl named Annabelle Higgins. Eerily, the student and her roommate attempted to nurture the spirit within the doll, only to experience malevolent and terrifying occurrences. These events would include the nursing student Donna returning home to see the Raggedy Ann doll had moved during the day without anyone else in the house. These movements were discreet and hard to notice at first. Eventually though, Annabelle would be in a completely different room than the one Donna left her in. The doll started doing even scarier acts after this, such as changing its position. Raggedy Ann dolls normally do not have the ability to kneel or stand up on their own, but this one did and would be found in weird parts of the house in said positions. Annabelle was also known to leave notes, often written on parchment paper, saying things along the lines of help us or help Lou. Lou was the name of Donna's roommate at the time. Donna even returned home one time to find small red blood stains on the Raggedy Ann doll. The same blood color that was written on the aforementioned notes. Things took a turn towards pure evil when physical harm came to those living under the same roof as Annabelle. On one occasion, Lou woke up in the middle of the night paralyzed while the Raggedy Ann doll watched him sleep before climbing over him and wringing his neck. During another, he was scratched by something invisible to him on the chest one day when he was attempting to pick up the doll in Donna's room. It was during this tumultuous period that the Warrens were contacted. Ed and Lorraine declared the doll to be demonically possessed Ed was certain the demon was responsible for at least three deaths prior to her current haunts. They relocated Annabelle to their occult museum in Monroe, Connecticut, where it was displayed in a glass box, reportedly to prevent any further sinister incidents. This imprisonment of the doll, with a warning for it never to be released into the world again, makes the Warrens real and raw terror all the more authentic. The Snedeker House. The story of Carmen and Alan Snedeker, their three sons, daughter, and two nieces, in Southington, Connecticut, is one of inexplicable horror and paranormal encounters. Moving into what they thought was an ordinary home, they soon discovered its dark history as a former funeral parlor, complete with unsettling relics in the basement. The Snedeker family's journey began when they relocated to Connecticut to be closer to medical treatment for their eldest sons, Hodgkin's lymphoma. Unbeknownst to them, the house they rented had once been a funeral parlor. Despite the macabre discovery, they chose to stay, primarily due to financial constraints. It was more affordable to enjoy the eerie atmosphere than to find a new home suitable for their large family. The unsettling events in the house started innocently enough with items mysteriously disappearing. However, things took a terrifying turn when the children began reporting sightings of strange figures, including a man with long black hair. The eldest son experienced a drastic personality change marked by violent outbursts and unexplained attacks on family members. While doctors diagnosed him with schizophrenia, the family believed these distressing behaviors were linked to the malevolent presence within their home. Perhaps the most disturbing claim was made by the parents, who asserted that they had been sexually assaulted by an unseen force in the house. These eerie incidents left many bewildered as to why the family chose to remain in such a haunted environment for two more years. Desperate for relief from the relentless torment, the Snedeker family sought the assistance of Ed and Lorraine Warren. The Warrens based in Connecticut were a controversial duo in the world of paranormal investigations at the time but served as the family's best bet to figure out what had happened in their home. Ed the demonologist partnered with his wife Lorraine, the clairvoyant, to explore this supernatural phenomena. Their involvement in the haunting in Connecticut case was pivotal, as they spent weeks in the haunted house to gain a comprehensive understanding of the alleged malevolence. After their extensive investigation, the Warrens declared that the morticians, who had operated in the house during its funeral parlor days, had practiced necromancy, infusing the home with profound evil. 
They believed this malevolent energy was responsible for the family's terrifying experiences. To rid the house of this darkness and make it safe for the Snedeker family, the Warrens performed an exorcism. While the Warrens felt their exorcism did enough to warrant the Snedeker's return to their Connecticut home, it would go down as one of the most dark and draining investigations of their career. Rest assured, Ed and Lorraine avoided that corner of the state for the remainder of their lives. The Smurl Haunting In August 1973, the Smurl family moved into a seemingly ordinary double-block house on Chase Street in West Pittston, Pennsylvania. Little did they know that their new home would become the center of a terrifying ordeal marked by disturbing claims of paranormal activity. The Smurl family's nightmare began with what they described as a demonic presence within their home. They reported a litany of supernatural occurrences, including loud noises, foul odors, physical assaults on family members, and even the shocking incident of their dog being thrown against the wall. The entity seemed relentless, shaking their mattress, pushing one of their daughters down a flight of stairs, and allegedly subjecting family members to both physical and sexual assaults. In 1986, seeking relief from the relentless torment, the family turned to renowned demonologists, Ed and Lorraine Warren. Ed characterized the demon inhibiting the Smill home as very powerful. The Warrens attempted to persuade the entity to leave by playing religious music and offering prayers. According to Ed, their efforts triggered unsettling manifestations, including shaking mirrors and furniture. He claimed to have felt a drop in temperature and witnessed the formation of a dark mass within the house. On one occasion, the entity left a chilling message on a mirror, instructing them to get out. The Warrens also asserted that they possessed audio tapes containing eerie knocking and rapping sounds attributed to the malevolent force. Representatives of the Roman Catholic Church, Diocese of Scranton, were unsure about the source of the disturbances. Theology professor Alphonus Trabold suggested there might be alternative, less demonic explanations. Several priests blessed the home and reported no harmful activity during their visits. Janet Smurl claimed that an unidentified priest had performed three unsuccessful exorcisms as the demon allegedly evaded the rituals by moving between the two halves of the double block home and following the family to other locations. Despite initially expressing weariness with media attention, the Smurl family authored a book, The Haunted, in collaboration with Ed and Lorraine Warren detailing their haunting experiences. The Warrens continued to assert that the Smill home was inhabited not only by a demon, but also by four spirits, including the shocking claim of sexual assault on Jack and Janet Smill. Whether one believes in the Smill family's chilling encounters or regards them as a mystery yet to be fully explained, their story serves as a haunting reminder of the uncharted territories of the supernatural a story that continued to spur the nightmares of Ed and Lorraine Warren for decades. Arnie Johnson The chilling story of Arnie Cheyenne Johnson's alleged demonic possession is a tale that delves into the realms of the supernatural and the inexplicable. The events surrounding Johnson's possession, which eventually led to a gruesome murder, are shrouded in mystery and controversy. Arnie Cheyenne Johnson and Debbie Glatzel's stories began when they acquired a rental property that would soon become the epicenter of their supernatural ordeal. Their initial encounter involved David, Debbie's brother, who claimed to have been confronted by an elderly man with sinister intentions. Although the family initially dismissed it as an excuse to avoid chores, David insisted that the man had threatened harm if they moved into the rental home. David's visions escalated with the elderly man taking on a demonic form, muttering Latin and making threats against his soul. As David's visions intensified, so did the paranormal activity. Night terrors, unexplained scratches and bruises plagued him. The family called upon a Catholic priest to bless the house, but the terror persisted, leading them to conclude that the house was malevolent and unfit for habitation. They also experienced David's transformation, marked by growling, hissing and speaking in otherworldly voices, 
as well as reciting passages from the Bible and Paradise Lost. The family members took turns staying awake at night as David endured spasms and convulsions. Desperate for help, the family summoned the renowned demonologists, Ed and Lorraine Warren. Lorraine witnessed a black mist near David, signifying a malevolent presence. The Warrens were told of David being choked and beaten by invisible hands, with red marks appearing on his neck afterwards. They diagnosed David with multiple possessions and performed three lesser exorcisms. During these exorcisms, David allegedly levitated, stopped breathing temporarily, and displayed precognitive abilities, notably predicting the manslaughter that Arnie Johnson would later commit. The story took a shocking turn when Arnie Johnson coerced one of the demons supposedly within David to possess him during the exorcisms. According to Johnson's account, after egging the demon on, he was violently attacked by the entity, which allegedly took control of his car and crashed it into a tree. This incident left Johnson unharmed but deeply affected. He later encountered the demon at an old well, making eye contact with it and subsequently becoming possessed. Debbie and Johnson moved into an apartment near her workplace, but Johnson exhibited similar strange behaviour to David's, falling into trances and experiencing hallucinations. On February 16, 1981, a tragic event unfolded. Johnson called in sick to his job and joined Debbie, her cousin Mary, and his sister Wanda at her workplace. After a lunch with heavy drinking, tensions escalated with their landlord and employer, Alan Bono. Johnson, in a growling, animalistic state, fatally stabbed Bono. Bono suffered multiple wounds, including a fatal one stretching from his stomach to the base of his heart. This event marked the first unlawful killing in the history of Brookfield, Connecticut. In the aftermath of the murder, Lorraine Warren informed the Brookfield police that Johnson was possessed during the crime. The case remained steeped in controversy, with the paranormal aspects complicating the legal proceedings. In the end though, Johnson could not be found innocent as a result of demonic possession, taking account of the killing. He was convicted of first degree manslaughter and served five years of a 10 to 20 year sentencing. Ed and Lorraine maintained their position on the case even after the official ruling came in. And it goes without saying, their involvement with such a horrific case stayed with them long after Johnson went to prison. How terrifying it must have been for them to realize that demonic possession in their eyes could lead to such cold-blooded murder. So that's it for this video. That was five cases that terrified the Warrens. There are many more cases that the Warrens were involved in, and if you'd like to see more, then let us know in the comments section below. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you right back here tomorrow for another creepy video.